Uh, welcome to the February 6, 2020 IPM Technical Advisory Committee. Thank you all for coming. In case you're in the wrong place, you're here now. Uh, we have uh, Michael Bieski also, who is one of the authors, of, who is like one of the primary authors of what I'm going to talk about, the Pest Prevention by Design for Landscape Guidelines. At long last, we have it ready to share with people. So it's been a two-year process. Uh, we knew it was going to take a long time when we started. I said it multiple times because it was unfunded, but we finally have something for you. So really excited about that. So I, I'm going to move on. So our agenda today is very simple. We're going to uh, run through uh, the, the new resources that we've been working on, and many of you were involved in this. And I just want to thank all of you for your hard work on it. We have a list of the names who participated in the work group later on, and it's very long. Uh, so I'm going to run through this, and really, uh, this is being posted today on our website, and I'll tell you uh, based, some, a little bit of background. I have to have my big general background, of course, to make it all very grandiose and so forth, and then we'll get into what's in the guidelines and uh, the various ways that we've put it together. We've got multiple ways to use these guidelines, and I'll, I'll talk about that. So just to get started, let's start with the big picture. We're not alone here, in case you didn't notice. We're not the only organisms on this planet. Look around you. There are many of them, and we have to deal with them every day. In fact, we haven't been alone for about 4 billion years, I think, since we were bacterial slime, you know, covering the planet. Maybe we were one species then, but we didn't really think about it. Some of us were bacterial slime. So, and you know what happened. Uh, we're not only not alone, but we're surrounded, in fact, we're saturated with other organisms inside and outside, and it's a pretty amazing when you start to learn about all the ways that we're saturated with microbes, for example, inside of us and on every surface. And you know what? Evolution is an amazing thing. <laughs> Because here's, here's something, and this is something I, I, I'm always kind of marveling over, that without a planner, without a designer, without a plan, we end up with these amazing products. And that's what evolution does, right? That's what it's still doing, is it's selecting out what works, and what works ends up being really beautiful and amazing and functional, because it has to be to survive. So, I'm, I don't know, I'm sort of partial to moths, but. Um, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, we all have, <laughs> all these organisms have their needs, right? And sometimes those needs collide. And we don't even know what their needs are sometimes. We don't even know, we didn't know until recently that trees were talking to each other, for example. Like, did you know that? They, when trees, uh, it, not even clones, we're not even talking about alders or, or aspens, we're talking about adjacent trees, different species have communications through their roots when they're under, uh, under stress, for example, and immune responses on one tree can spread to a whole, a whole area. Or, you know, who knew that we had bacteria that live inside plants and help create an immune response to pests? And uh, who knew that, I mean, who would imagine that an orchid could evolve with an insect to look exa almost exactly like the female ex insect and actually smell exactly like the female bee, which is just freaky for me <laughs> to think about that. How, where did this come from? So evolution is, is an it's been an amazing thing, and it, it's resulted in these very complex creatures, and they all have very different needs. They're all unique. Sometimes those needs collide, and we have competition, and that, ha that includes humans with all, all those organisms you see outside and inside right now. And, you know, for me, that's the fascinating thing about, about pest management is where else are humans more directly competing with other organisms than in the field of, of pest management? That's where we're learning how to, how to not control, because we're not in control. I should have put another ominous thing up there. 
we're not in control, but uh, to, to manage. <laughs> and yeah, it's complicated. Um, maybe that's one of the, the big, uh, biggest problems we have as humans is trying to get over the fact that things aren't black and white, that there are always other impacts of our actions that we, maybe we're not thinking about. So that's you know where IPM fits in. IPM fits in very well with an ecologist's view of the world. It's all about applied ecology. And you know, it's more complicated than we ever think it is. It's just don't try to read it. But food webs, <laughs> all these. This is, I think, yeah. This is an aquatic food web. All the things that eat each other and all the different connections between them are are pretty amazing. And the same goes for the world around us right now. And we have um, a lot of things that have evolved and are still evolving. And right now, we're going through a big evolutionary acceleration, along with an acceleration of extinction, unfortunately. And what's causing that big acceleration? Well, yeah, I forgot to mention, killing's not always the answer. When we're trying to get, <laughs> just gonna, take that as you know, uh, an assumption. We don't always want to just kill them. If we can find another way, it doesn't always work for one thing. If something's competing with us, we might be able to finesse things a little more than just blanketing the landscape with something poison or, or whatnot. So, um, and, you know, prevention, that's where prevention comes in. It's not glorious. Why? Because <coughs> No one ever knows if you are successful. <laughs> no one ever notices if you're successful. You can't claim really that you are successful and have any evidence to show it. And also, of course, people don't want to think about pests until they're already a problem, right? So that's where our whole uh, emphasis on prevention has come from is the fact we realize that designs that we were uh, imposing on the landscape um, were susceptible and needlessly susceptible to all sorts of pests, whether it's weeds or rats or whatnot. And the big leap in evolution right now has a lot to do with us. Look at the, the world's most populous urban area in 1988. That's around Guangzhou in, in China. And in 2014, you have a lot of changing environments. You have a lot of concrete, a lot of infrastructure, we're adapting to our, our Earth, but there's a lot of organisms that have to adapt to us. And some of them are really good at it, right? Rats, cockroaches, but also, I mean, deer. Have you been to North Berkeley lately at night? And it's just like a herd of deer wandering around North Berkeley. Or possums or raccoons, coyotes, foxes, mountain lions, too. They're getting closer in. So we have a lot of a lot of ecological management to do. And if, if we're smart, while we're designing these huge changes to the landscape, we can design them in ways where we don't collide quite as directly with all those other living things. So that's my grandiose introduction to all this. Um, and that's where pest prevention by design, by design came from. Uh, you know, eight years ago, I think, was when we started talking about it, or maybe even longer in this group. We, most of you probably know this story, but we ended up getting a grant in 2012, 2013, put together with a national committee and with some money to back us up, put together the set of guidelines for buildings on how to build pests out of buildings. And that, product has been used a lot around the country, actually, and it's in the, referenced in the Green Building Guidelines. It is, has been used for pilot credits in green building, the green building world. And we've used it here in the city on 3,500 units of affordable housing, trying to build pest prevention into the conversion of the San Francisco Housing Authority. So, so far, 3,500 units um, are had some degree of pest prevention built into them. We don't know what we 
put a lot of work into it. We did a lot of trainings. We did a lot of discussions with architects and builders. Right now, we do have a grant to follow up on that to see how well those pest prevention uh, uh, tactics were, were done, how, how many of them were actually installed. Did they actually enclose the refuse area or not? Did they actually seal the cracks around the kitchen cabinet or not? And we're just starting on that. I, we hope to be done by the end of, well, early next year, early 2021. And Pestec is, is our contractor that's going to be helping us get all that data. So since, since all this happened, and you know, ever since we put out this resource, we have had people asking about landscapes. You know, is there something like this that you could do for landscapes? Because that's where most of you are working every day. Most of you are not facility managers. And especially something that would be aimed at the people who are designing the landscapes or retrofitting them. And so we kind of dawdled on that for a few years and finally two years ago decided to move ahead on it and we didn't have a grant. We, we thought, what well, we're gonna start small on this one, just kind of do a local version because Really, I don't know how much is out there. We didn't know how much is out there. Is, is this just really boring stuff like mulch, 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 you know? <laughs> or are there some other things that would be useful for, especially for landscape architects? So that's one reason we just didn't like go for the big money right from the start. Um, fortunately, we have um, a collaborator who is really, an ex not only an expert in this field, but really driven on the subject, and that's Michael Bajewski, before you now, who most of you know from other settings. But he's not gonna be jumping around the room today, so, <laughs> trained with the training. Michael does our trainings every spring. So we started with this two years, two years ago, we had a, a kind of wild event called a World Cafe that many of you attended which is like a speed dating style brainstorm session where we just sort of milk the room for every idea we could possibly get. And then we also reviewed all the literature that we could on the subject of preventing pests at the design stage in landscapes. Kind of put it all together in this big messy database and then assembled the work group that many of you participated in to go through this item by item and see what belonged and what didn't, and a lot of it's anecdotal. I mean, there is scientific, scientifically based things in there, but there's a lot of, as far as what's practical and useful, a lot of it is dependent on the people who are experts on the ground, which is you all. So we did all that, and then we spent a much longer time than I expected doing all the editing and organizing and so forth and we've put it together for you today. And I, I, here's, I'm just gonna flash through the list of work group people who participated to this. So many of you are here now. Um, but thank you again for your efforts on this. So what I'm gonna do is kind of go through the chapters that we came up with and do a little bit of explaining of the principles that we sort of distilled out of all this discussion. Um, and, you know, probably no one in this room is going to be surprised by anything in this book. But the, the idea is to put it all in one place so that if someone is act in the design stage, they can have it in front of them, especially people who aren't very experienced in landscape maintenance or pest management like you all. So that was the premise for this. And we did have uh, Public Works uh, ar landscape architects and other, other landscape architects. We had Jennifer and Rath, and we had lots of great folks on that working group to consult on these things. And one of the tricky parts is separating maintenance from design for a landscape, because landscapes are always being remade to some extent, right? or frequently being remade. And, you know, there are, there are lots of textbooks out there on how to, how to maintain a landscape, and we're not gonna write a book on that, right? That's just way beyond what we set out to do. So making that boundary, what we decided was, 
we would include maintenance planning as part of this because that is part of, we think that's part of the design plan. And we heard a lot of suggestions slash gripes from people in this group over the years about situations where maintenance really wasn't thought about before they put in a, a, a landscape, right? So maintenance, we, those sorts of things that are sort of on the borderline between maintenance and design, we stuck in the first chapter. And I mean, we kind of boiled it down to two principles, but there's a lot of things within those two principles. One is just basically you including maintenance in the planning, the design, administrative systems, and budgets for, for the landscape that's being designed and built. And again, it's, it's a fuzzy line between maintenance and, and design. And a lot of this, and what we kind of put together from the, the brightest people we could find on the subject, points to having a, a, a participatory approach to this, like involving the maintenance supervisors with the landscape architects or with whoever is designing this landscape to create, for example, a maintenance budget uh, or maintenance audit on what's already there or maintenance budget so that people aren't installing hedge, hedges, hedges that need to be trimmed every two weeks, for example, when you only have one gardener for thousands of acres, let's say, <laughs> or uh, so that you know, the turning radius in in the access roads is enough so that the wheels aren't going up into the landscape beds and bringing in weeds in the, in the open soil. Lots of things like that need to be thought about. And then, um, and then you know, including all this in, in, in the physical designs, and that includes sanitation. Things like, uh, for example, having a plan for cleaning equipment. This is out at Harding Park. So having a cleaning station for equipment. I don't know if that's still there, Matt. Is it still there? Yeah, OK. Mm. It's an old photo. Uh, moving, moving weeds around is a big problem. I mean, uh, you've, you've seen it here, right? Uh, and I, I know Matt and you, the IPM crew is, is really working on that. I'm trying to not carry around little bits of rhizome from site to site. Uh, and. So if you're designing a landscape, and you know, there's all sorts of landscapes out there, but I'm thinking more of a park or a golf course uh, or a restoration site, having some plan and maybe a place for cleaning that equipment is very important. So it's, I'm going to give you like one example from each of these chapters as I go through. But there are a lot, there are a lot of other ones to look at. Um, chapter two, we, we just bundle as soils and water. And here are the principles that we boiled it down to. Well, first of all, it's a lot of this is common sense, of course. You, use, you do the soil testing that you need to do, right? Not just for nutrients, but for texture, for uh, organic matter, and so forth, and looking at drainage. And you also have to know what kind of water you're going to be using. You know, if it's got a lot of salts in it or a lot of nitrates in it, boron, and so forth and use that to inform your plant selection. So that's, we have lots of great resources for that. Uh, SF Plant Finder can help uh, with some of that. Um, there are other resources that we have listed in the database. And then uh, manage the soils to reduce pest problems. So. Um, for example, okay, let's make sure we have enough drainage. Okay, this is, this is um, pretty obvious. Am I in the wrong spot? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not used to this being videoed stuff yet. Make sure you don't have water standing for longer than 72 hours ever because other, otherwise you will have the potential for mosquitoes, right? Um, making sure that you have drainage in planters. Uh, in permanent planters around the landscape so that you're not having mosquito problems um, and so forth. So there are lots of examples like that that we covered. That's not a very good image. A big one, of course, planting design and that information about soils and water fits into this also. It's all kind of connected. 
I'll, I'll go through some, some more specific examples of this later also, by the way. But the, we, we boiled this down to, first of all, designing with the whole area in mind. Like, you have to know if there is a big field of ivy next door with a bunch of garbage, so ideal rat habitat. It's good to know that before you decide where, the, where to put the kid's playground and what kind of setup to have, you know, what kind of landscaping to include. You might want to have a discontinuity between that ivy <laughs> and your own, your bushes that you're installing, for example. Um, you might want to have better sanitation for it as well. So there are a whole list of things that you can look for on the site before the design is even, is even put on paper. Prioritizing plant diversity is always important for multiple reasons. And that uh, includes emphasizing native plants, of course, because native plants support the native e ecosystem. And you have a more robust ecosystem at least in theory and probably in reality, you're going to have more natural controls for pests in that system. But also, you can, especially a good example is thinking about trees. When you plant all the same species of trees, you're setting yourself up for pitch canker on Monterey Pines or for emerald ash borer. Uh, in some cities back east, they're having to kind of replace all their street, tr street trees because they didn't include diversity in the mix. Um, of course, don't introduce invasive plants, but we might say of course, but there are probably a lot of other people who may not think about this. They, they will say, oh yeah, that pompous grass will look really nice here on this hillside. And, and uh, then also in some cases, uh, like, uh, I mean, fuchsia is a good example, for choosing the pest resistant varieties. There are pest resistant varieties for, for problematic plants that you already know are likely to have, for example, bud mites on fuchsias or thrips on, uh, on rhododendrons. Um, one example, I mean, this is the example we always talk about. <laughs> Don't put rat habitat in. I mean, ivy, of course. We all love the way ivy, well, the rats love the way ivy supports them, gives them food, water, and shelter and no one ever messes with them. Uh, chapter four is physical barriers. And this is prob probably what most people think of when they think of this whole topic is how we can you know, wall, wall the pests out of certain areas. And we boil that down to two principles, which is uh, maybe may or may not make logical sense, but First of all, just using things like screening and edging and uh, weed barriers, fabrics, and so forth, geotextiles in strategic places to keep weeds and keep rodents out of various parts of your landscape. And then uh, mulch is kind of, kind of fits into that, but it's its own animal because there's so many kinds of mulch. and so many situations where it may or may not be the right selection. Uh, so uh, we have several items on mulch in the resource. Here's one example from that, that chapter, you know, putting in uh, wire barriers for rodents. These are a, this is a product for tree wells uh, that um, I, I hear is fairly popular these days in, in New York in uh, geomesh. They use in the really high intensity rat areas in urban areas around their street trees to keep them from burrowing. Uh, and then the last chapter is sanitation. Let's see. That's a familiar looking PUC employee. <coughs> uh, but in, in, it's especially in sensitive restoration sites, of course, this is especially important. Where we have Phytophthora that may be making the rounds or a sudden oak death having a way to at least minimize what you're bringing in and out of that area is super important. And so in this case, they've got a boot brush and they have other, other measures as well, uh, sanitizers for, for boots and, and for equipment. And I'm sure it, you all do this for, for some of your equipment, for pruning, for example, as well. So a lot of this is standard practice, uh, but some of it fits into the design. You, know, you want to make sure in the design there's a sanitation station. Okay, or room for all that. 
uh, some of the items that fell under sanitation were screening seeds, you know, check, check the weed seed content or the invasive, see if there's noxious weeds, there's, there shouldn't be, uh, but check the label. The label has a lot of information that's very useful about the seed, germination rates and all that. Uh, you know, know that better than I. Checking nursery stock, if there's time for big plantings and putting that into procedures and plans. Uh, minimizing refuse, like how can we invent, invent a better dumpster, <laughs> right? Or a better recycling receptacle to keep the pests out? How can we uh, make sure we have enough pickups scheduled for the trash so it doesn't pile up around the outside and feed the rats? Um, how can we make sure we're putting the right things in the right bin so they're not putting garbage in the trash bin and so forth? And then, um, I mean, I kind of talked about it already, but preventing the import of new pests and diseases in every way we can. So yeah, dumpsters, great, great example. What can we do to keep those lids shut? If you just keep the lid shut on a standard dumpster, that goes a long way. But that's really hard in some location, locations. How, what kind of a policy can you have for that? Or what kind of equipment that would be better suited for making sure it stays shut? Okay, so that's like the outline of the guidelines. And there are two, we decided on t having it available in two ways. One is kind of a standard PDF booklet, which is, we, we figured out a way that we can kind of push some buttons and download this database into a booklet in PDF, which was this great revelation. Well, kind of a revelation. <laughs> Maybe not a revelation for Jen. Um, and so this, some people are more comfortable with, with this format. I'll, I'll show you in a moment what it looks like. And you can still search it. It's a PDF. You can print it out if you're the paper type of person, that you, if you need something on your shelf. The PDF download doesn't have all the info. So we have information about tools, like samples of products in there. We have all the references, and we have attachments. We have some other useful guidance that's linked in to the database. And you won't obviously be able to access through that through the PDF. If you want kind of the more in-depth version, this is kind of out of focus, isn't it? Then um, it's, you should, you're better off using the database, which isn't maybe quite as pretty in terms of layout and so forth, <clears throat> but it gives you access to all this stuff. And the great thing about this was it's, uh, we can update it any time. It's very easy to update it. So this is a living document. So this is, as we move forward, you know, we have lots of more TAC meetings going into the infinite future, and someone has a great idea, and someone tries something out, and it works. You can stick it in here, right? So it's, it's a place where we can keep this stuff. <clears throat> this is going on our website today. The, the actual links, if all goes well, Nothing crashes. And what I'll do now is I can um, kind of show you what it looks, I hope, what it looks like online. Oh. It's about as sharp as it gets. So, oh, this is, this is what it looks like on the other version. There's actually two online <clears throat> ways of looking at it. One is sort of like a gallery, like this. I'll show you in a second. And one is more kind of a spreadsheet, but it's organized by chapters. So, and, the, and, and this, just, this is like the instructions that are hard. I mean, we're, we're limited on what we can do with this particular piece of software. Like, we couldn't make it super, super user friendly. But the good side is, it's cheap, and we don't need an IT contractor to keep it up. We can do it ourselves. So that's, that's why we had the PDF also. But one, the one thing you need to know is this little tab right here. So there's a gallery. <clears throat> and then there's this other view, which is more like a spreadsheet. Um, the, so you know people like it either way. On the spreadsheet, you can collapse chapters. 
like this. So here's each of the chapters. And, um, you know, so that's, that's kind of the shortcut for finding things in here. You can search it, of course, as well. <coughs> um, which, which one do you think, we should, what chapter should we look at? Planning design, okay. So chapter, this, this is the planning design chapter. I don't know if you can all, hmm, can I make this bigger? A little bit bigger, okay. So, you know, you have to treat this a little bit like a spreadsheet, but you'll find a, a, a paragraph summary. Um, and then info on how this particular item affects pest management. So let's see, let me go down to something that's a little more. All right, well, let's just look at this. Rodent proof planter boxes, okay. Um, planter boxes designed to maintain without gaps that allow rodent access. Uh, if there's steel, that's great. Prevent, if you can't see the whole thing, you can click on these little <coughs> arrows and it will show you the whole thing, the whole cell. If you want a, an, another way of looking at it, the whole tactic, you can go over here, whoops, and it will show you all the information in one, in a different kind of format. It will tell you if it's, whoops, sorry. So how it affects pest management, trade-offs with other objectives. We've got to take the word copy off of that. <laughs> um, and sometimes those, there's a, there are a lot of trade-offs. It tells whether it's primarily for design or retrofit stages. And then we have the references. And the references are all stored up here in this other tab that says, strangely enough, references. And you can click on that and get the full citation if this is the sort of thing you're interested in. And these citations, like here with uh, DPH rules and regs on rodents, we have the links for it as well. So you can go directly to it. Same with products and tools. Products and tools, this is like that gray area as a government agency. We're not, we don't want to appear that we're recommending things and we have to have all sorts of caveats but we need to have examples on this. And I actually think that's, this is the most interesting part of it. <laughs> it's finding the new tools, especially for exclusion, because there's a lot of stuff out there. And this is one place where I'd love to hear suggestions from this group for tools that need to be added. It's like, it's your homework, okay? <laughs> but <clears throat> the products and tools are listed down here. You can click on it and get more information, including a link to it. Um, and in fact, it even will tell you what, what, what other tactics that's linked to. Um, I think that was it, right? It was the products, tools, references, the image. Oops. I hate this computer. Hate it, hate it. Oh, it will also, so we also have CSI codes. And we're still completing the, these, but for those of you who are in the architecture world, this is the language of, of architects, is uh, construction specifiers institute codes. And whenever you have construction plans, they're always organized by these codes. So if you're putting together a plan, this will be a convenience for you because you can look at what should be in, what should be in wildlife deterrent fence code, okay? <laughs> Here's what we have. We are still, these are still being checked by people who know more about these things at, um, Public works. So those are two ways, two ways to look at it. Actually, you can look at it like a spreadsheet or you can expand it with those little arrows. Either way, it gives you the same thing. Um, oh, I should also point out that uh, we also organize them by pests. So which pests are likely to be affected by this tactic? And then the different kinds of landscapes. So you can actually, if you're really a computer geek, if there's any nerds in the room, you can do custom, you can do filters up here. And I won't, you know, I won't get on your case if you never do this, but you can add a filter 
and look for landscapes, for example. I can look for, I'll pick where I'm sorting by. So I want everything that is, um, has golf course listed. So it'll filter out all the golf course items for you automatically. And then you can just take it away by hitting the X. By color? <laughs> Probably. Maybe if you show the custom color. Yeah. I don't know if we have rainbow, but that's fine. But we, yeah, there's, there are lots of things you can do with it on your own, and, um, and it's not going to affect the database. So you, you can't write into it. It's not going to change anything. You can just feel free to mess with it. I shouldn't. Should I say that? Maybe you shouldn't say that. <laughs> well, don't really mess with it. So that's, that's this, this grid view. And you know if you click on these tabs, you just want all the references. They're right here. It tells which tactics they apply to. Feel free to butt in, by the way. I'm just talking a lot. Jan, Jan Monet is the one who did a lot of the, the organizing. So you're going to get a round of applause at the end of this. Um, and then here's the list of tools. So again, with tools, you can look at it as a grid like this, or it's kind of better to look at it, I think, like this. So you've got the Barracuda Varmint Vault. <laughs> um, you've got um, Earth Edge, Rubber Roll for most strips, uh, Gopher Baskets if you choose to use them. Um, so there's things in here that are examples. Some of them actually may be bad examples. I want to know that too, please. Uh, but this is a work, like I said, a work in progress. If you go back to the tactics, most of the things that you want to know are in the tactics tab. <clears throat> and here is the, a gallery view of that, which some people might find a little more inviting. And these are also organized by chapter. But you're going to need to click on it to see what's in it, right? So. Um, Hate this pan. Um, okay, planter drainage. So it's the same deal. You'll see it's you'll see that view that you saw before from the grid with everything in it. And in this case, there's no products or tools. Uh, you may see some of these hidden. So right now th these are unhidden, but I usually have it hidden like this. So it just shows the minimum. So that's, does that make sense to folks? Um, it's available real time. It will be updated immediately when, whenever we add something. And we plan to have this be a living document. Now, do you have the link for the, we also have a PDF here. I can put it in here. Just take this out. I'll show you what the PDF version looks like. So I can get there. Yep. Can you comment on where we will find this, where we'll run it on the Yes. Oh, I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah. So it's, I'm going to send it around as an email, too. It'll be a, a, to the whole list. It's on the sfenvironment.org website uh, under IPM. So we already have a place there for the pest prevention by design for structures. And we're going to have it right right next to that, so structures and landscapes. So this is the handbook, the PDF version. And um, probably should make it a little smaller, huh? Mm -hmm. This is it. And it, it turns out with this version, it's um, well, well, we have the intro, which you don't see. There's some, a table of contents, of course. And, you know, there's some, some text that we don't yet have on the website. We probably will find a way to put that on there separately for those who want to use their database. But um, this is also organized by chapter. And we have the principles for each chapter. And then we go through one, one tactic per page. So it's you know, a little easier to look at, um, not as much info, 
and like I said, this is automatically generated, so it's maybe not the layout. Sometimes you'll see, you know, in the, the tools box, none listed, yeah. but the box is still there. Things like that that designers hate, but can't help it. It's worth it. So, um, so this is what the, the PDF looks like. And, you know, I'm sure, I, I don't know which I would use more, actually. Um, an architect once told me that they like to have the paper thing sitting on the, on the shelf. I don't think it was you, Cole. I thought maybe it might have been someone else. Do you think that's true, or is it all digital now? Very personal. Very personal? Yes. So anyway, we have this option. That is also available, and I don't think there's anything else here that you haven't seen. Um, but it looks nice, Jen. We just finished this yesterday. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> so, <laughs> way to go, Jen. Um, and there's a list of references and an appendix of tools at the end. Oh, okay. Um, so you can, you can have it all in one place if you want to skip through it quickly. Yeah. Um, oh, where is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, references by chapter. Yeah, by chapter. And by then. Chapter. Or, oh, by tactic number. Oh, my gosh. All right. And then, um, and then, yeah, the tools are in the appendix. So, which, you know, it's there for you. It, it, like, it's, I think it's a lot easier to use the database for that stuff. But, you know, if you're a paper kind of person, go for it. So, I, you know, that... That is, that's all for the presentation, but I did want to, I mean, first, if there's any Q&A about, about the project, I'm happy to field that. And then I want to ask you some questions. But. <laughs> One question, where is this going to be available? We're, we're going to send the, the uh, URLs around on the list, but it's on the sfenvironment.org website in the IPM, IPM pages. And uh, you can search for pest prevention by design in there and you'll find it. So we will send that around.